chapter 14, Two Societies at War, part two, and we're talking about the Civil War here. Okay, so Lincoln changed his strategy of a peace by compromise to one of total war. So what does that mean? It's a form of warfare that mobilizes all of society's resources, including economical, political, and cultural, uh, to support this military effort. Okay, so what's happening on the home front? Bo both sides, of course, are mobilizing armies, civilians. Uh, both sides were patriotic to their cause. This is a quote from a Union recruit. I don't think a young man ever went over all the considerations more carefully as I have. It might mean sickness, wounds, loss of limb, or even life itself. But my country was in danger. So were, were the Union soldiers lining up to end slavery? I mean, I mean no. The, the, the vast majority did for honor and adventure, a sense of patriotic duty to, to preserve the Union. So it's, it's a myth of American history to think that the North – rose up to end slavery. That, that was not the case, though it would be used later to justify the huge loss of life. But the South also rallied to the cause. This is a Southern enlistee. Would you, my darling, be willing to leave your children under such a despotic Union government? No, I know you would, you would sacrifice every comfort on earth rather than submit to it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the South started start a draft. So this is the first draft in United States history. Why did they do that? Because there wasn't enough men down there, so they had to draft men to, to, to put numbers of men in the field. Uh, many people volunteered, but it wasn't enough. In the North, you didn't have that problem. You had so many men, and they all volunteered. So compulsory military service has begun here. Three years of service for all men aged 18 to 35. <clears throat> but after Antietam and the large numbers of casualties, the, the maximum age was raised to 45. Women on both sides joined the war effort as nurses, clerks, factory workers in the North. Also in the North, many joined the Sanitary Commission and the Freedmen's Aid Bureau. Uh, so both sides are mobilizing resources, and the South had to make the the best of theirs because they were very much had very much less than the North had available to them. But they always had King Cotton. That that's always the the trump for them. Their lean export and a crucial staple of the 19th century economy for them that kept them relevant during this war, especially as the first two years went so well, where the Northern generals could not uh, compete with Robert E. Lee. Okay. But 1863, you have a turning point in this war, and the fortunes of the North began to change. They became a more co cohesive unit, partly as, as a result of better leadership. So this is, the, this is a quote from Henry Adams. Uh, Henry Adams is the grandson of John Quincy Adams, the former president. Uh, little by little, one began to feel that behind the chaos of Washington, power was taking shape, that it was massed and guided as it had not been before. Okay. Okay, um, let me see here. Let's let's take a break and watch our first film, and this is entitled "The Story of the United uh, the Story of Us: The Emancipation Proclamation." Then, when we come back, we'll go into Supplemental Lecture Number 15. So, go ahead and watch the film. Okay. Okay, let's do this Supplemental <coughs> Lecture, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, and we'll do our our outline here. Number one: Did the emancipation free slaves? Letter A. Lincoln wanted to preserve the Union. Letter B, did, want, did not want to interfere with slavery. Number two, higher cause. Letter A, ex-slaves want to join the fight. Letter B, war for freedom. Number three, the emancipation, 1863. <clears throat> Letter A, rebellious states. Letter B, border states. Letter C, really did not free anyone. Number four, 13th Amendment. Letter A, abolish slavery. Letter B, a sacred moment in U.S. history. And then number five, relevance. Today, the Emancipation Proclamation continues to be a symbol of equality and social justice, <clears throat> although its reality in its beginning was really neither. It didn't free anybody. Okay. Okay, let's get started. So, so we all know what the Emancipation Proclamation did, or at least we think we know. It freed the slaves, but did it really free the slaves? At the start of the war, Lincoln claimed the purpose was the preservation of the Union, his purpose, rather than the abolition of slavery. Although he was personally against slavery, and he believed that slavery was an unqualified evil to the Negro, the white man, and the state, 
Initially, he was more concerned with saving the Union, okay? In his first inaugural address, he declares that he had no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with slavery in the states where it exists. So he knew also that, that neither Northerners nor the border slave states would support abolition as a war aim. So he went after to preserve the Union in the beginning. But by mid-1862, one year in, as thousands of slaves fled to join the invading northern armies, Lincoln was convinced that abolition had become a sound military strategy as well as the morally correct path. So he decides to issue the proclamation, but did it put an end to slavery? So it declared that all persons held as slaves shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. These are very hallowed words, sacred words in our history, okay? But the problem with this is it's, it's skipping around a lot of the other words. It's just taking out the good parts, and it's making it look like this proclamation freed all the slaves. That's, that's not entirely true, okay? Um, if, you, if, you read the, um, if you read the entire uh, uh, comment, you see it a little bit differently, okay? Uh, on this first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves, and here's the key part, within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforward and forever free. So what's that saying? It's saying that the slaves that were in the states that were in rebellion are free. Okay, that's what it, that's what it's saying. Uh, continuing on, and the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons, and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. Okay. <clears throat> So that so the the emancipation is misleading because it's freeing the slaves is not exactly what it did. It applied only to the states that were in rebellion. It applied only to states that had seceded from the Union. It left slavery untouched in the loyal border states. So if you were a slave in the border states of Delaware, Kentucky, Maryland, Missouri, you were not freed. And that's not very fair. But yet why did Lincoln do that? He did not want to lose their support. He did not want to anger them and cause them to shift their support to the South. The border states stayed loyal, but they could have gone either way. If you're going to take away their slaves, they would go with the South. And, of course, the South would benefit from all those people and resources. Okay. Uh, so if you were a slave in one of these border states, you remained a slave. You were not freed. Uh, so think about it. only the slaves in the Confederate states were freed. But what, what were the real chances of that happening? The South was at war with the United States. They weren't, they weren't about to listen to anything Lincoln said. If you were a, a farmer in Mississippi, maybe you owned a plantation, and your sons were at war fighting, the, fighting for the Confederacy, and you have 15 slaves, and then the president of the country that you're fighting against says all slaves in your state are free, are you going to go out there and free them? No, you're not going to listen to the president of the United States. You're at war with them. So it didn't really free anybody, okay? I mean, this this, this just didn't happen uh, the way that people think, okay? The Confederate states weren't going to free them, and the border states weren't freed. So who was free? Uh, the emancipation also exempted parts of the Confederates that had come under northern control. So if, if the north was in control of an area, they were allowed to continue to have slavery. Uh, so most important to understand about the Emancipation Proclamation, the freedom it promised depended upon Union military victory. It would have no relevance at all if the South won the war because they weren't about to abide by something that Lincoln told them to do. So you could say that the Emancipation should have an asterisk after it that said that it only would apply if the North wins the war. Okay. Uh, because the emancipation literally freed nobody, but it was a genius move. It was a military move. This is this is this is Lincoln at his best. Lincoln tries to create a greater cause for the war. Uh, as as we know, the military aspect had not been going well for the North, so he decides to free the slaves to create a drama. Uh, so although the emancipation proclamation did not end slavery in the nation. It captured the hearts and imaginations of millions of Americans 
and it fundamentally transformed the character of the war. It gave it a higher cause. It's no longer about just the union or tariffs or states' rights or taxes. It's about freedom now. That's what America's about. It gave it a higher cause. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation also allowed black troops to enter into the uh, uh, American military, uh, accepting black men in the Union Army and Navy. Uh, this, this, of course, enables the liberated to become liberators, and they're going to go back and fight their, their former masters. 200,000 black soldiers and sailors fight for the Union and freedom. But here's, here's the genius part. Lincoln also knew that no European country would ever support the South after this proclamation, because if you do that, you're saying, I'm, we are fighting for the continuation of slavery. Uh, England was considering backing the Confederacy, much like the French had done in the American Revolution when they backed the American colonists. Uh, but it was a different different idea then, okay? Um, if, if the war was going to be defined as a war for or against slavery, no country, specifically England, would want to be part of a war that condoned slavery. So this took that, that fear the North had of a European country coming in to help the Confederacy out of the equation. Uh, so it's a genius move by Lincoln, but, but hardly the foundation of civil rights. Uh, the careful planning of this document with Lincoln releasing it at just the right moment in the war, he was waiting for a victory. Of course, those were not coming along very, very quickly. But finally, the, the uh, victory at Antietam, uh, and this would ensure that it would have a positive effect, impact on the Union efforts and redefine the purpose of the war. So, so, so submit it when, of course, the northern people are happy with the victory. Uh, the proclamation provided the freed slaves with the, with the support of the U.S. government, including the Army and the Navy. Okay, um, This becomes official January 1st, 1863. Pled that free slaves should be paid a wage. It urged free slaves to abstain from violence except in self-defense. It publicly declared that all suitable freed men would be accepted into the armed services to fight in the war. This, of course, brings shock waves to the South. Not that they didn't expect it on some level, but their chances of negotiating a peace that would allow for the continuation of slavery now seem remote. How can you negotiate for peace when the president said it's illegal? Okay. The only chance they had now to, pres to preserve their way of life would be to win the war outright. And the chances of that happening after a very promising beginning was looking more remote. Uh, another positive result of the Emancipation Proclamation was the 13th Amendment. It's completely abolished slavery in the United States. Uh, but again, this would depend on the Union winning the war. But that was becoming much more likely. Lincoln recognized that the emancipation was more of a war measure, but it would have no constitutional validity once the war was over. Uh, the, the legal framework of slavery would still exist in the former Confederate states. So, uh, so he decided to make it an amendment, make it a constitutional amendment to abolish it. That would end it once and for all. And the overwhelming, overwhelmingly Republican Senate passed the 13th Amendment, uh, and this comes into play. So when this war is over and the Union wins, you know, the slavery is abolished. There's, there's no question about it. So this, this amendment made, it, made that very clear, okay? And, of course, in the 13th Amendment, was it say, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. That's the end of it, okay? The 13th Amendment officially ends slavery in the United States. Okay, re uh, relevance of the lecture. Today, the Emancipation Proclamation continues to be a symbol of equality and social justice, although its reality in its beginning was really neither. It didn't free anybody. Okay, okay that is the end of supplemental lecture number 15. So let's move on here. So as I said, 1863 saw the Union gain victories, and they, and they turned the tide. And we're going to talk about these two Major victories of 1863, and we'll start with Vicksburg is the first one. So we talked about that before. Grant is moving on Vicksburg, trying to get there, capture Vicksburg, and you control the Mississippi River. Uh, so, so Vicksburg, Mississippi, a very strategic location on the Mississippi River, 
anyone in command of that town commanded the river. This would prove to be one of the Union's most successful campaigns of the entire war. Uh, although Grant's first attempt to take the city failed in the winter of 1862-63, he renewed his efforts in the spring. The, the problem was approaching Vicksburg from the north coming south, most of the lands around Vicksburg are kind of swampy and hard to, to get across. So Grant realized that his best uh, approach to invade Vicksburg was to, was to get below the city, get south of it, then come up and from behind and, and it, uh, uh, approach it that way. Okay, This is a little bit challenging. How do you do this? How do you get your army below the, the fortifications of Vicksburg? Actually, the army wasn't the problem. The army could march you know, miles away. And do it that way. But what about your Navy? They have to have water. They're ships, okay? So they come up with this plan to float the flotilla past the Vicksburg defenses in the dead of night. So every every light was put out. Oars were wrapped with cloth or burlap so they wouldn't splash in the water. Uh, no cigarettes, nothing. And the entire Union Navy floated by Vicksburg in the dead of night with, with all this artillery on the heights above them, waiting to blow them out of the water. But they didn't see them because it was nighttime. It was dead you know, very early in the morning. Uh, it wasn't until the very end that the Confederate uh, forces at Vicksburg saw that this fleet's going by, and they started to fire on them and hit a few ships. But for the most part, Porter gets his entire Navy below the city. Grant meets them there and turns towards Vicksburg, okay? Uh and he, and he comes up and makes his turn and comes comes north. And along the way, of course, he uh, he has some battles. He uh, he defeats he defeats a Confederate force near Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, as he gets closer to the city of Vicksburg, he defeats a force under General John C. Pemberton. Uh, Pemberton retreats back into Vicksburg and uh, behind fortifications. So of course, the city knew that Grant was coming sooner or later, and they, they had built a, uh, a 15 miles of trenches around the town uh, to you know be prepared for this assault. So the Confederates were well entrenched inside the city. So Grant comes up to the city, surrounds it, lays siege to us. So you're going to bombard it and starve them out. They no water in, no food in, nobody out, okay? Uh, so Grant, Grant starts this siege and, and uh, starts to bomb and, you know, relentless bombing. Pemberton's got 29,000 troops inside, uh, but not, not much. I mean, what kind, of, what, what kind of defense can you do you have? You don't really have any. You're just going to wait this out. So Grant continuously shelled the city between May 18th, July 4th, uh, six, seven weeks or so. Uh, and, of course, this, this brought havoc on the Vicksburg people. Uh, to escape the continuous bombing, the residents of Vicksburg dug over 500 caves in the hills around the city and lived in the caves to escape the bombing. Okay, Many of these caves are still there. You can visit there. I've been there. And these trenches are still there. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty interesting place to, to visit. Uh, so only a matter of time before Grant with 70,000 troops would capture Vicksburg. Attempts to rescue Pemberton and his Confederate forces failed from both the east and the west. And conditions, of course, deteriorated rapidly for the people in Vicksburg. And finally, Pemberton was forced to retreat, I'm sorry, to surrender on July 4th. And Lincoln hears the news and he claims the Mississippi River again goes unvexed to the sea. There's nothing stopping them. We have control of the river. This is a crippling blow to the Confederacy. Uh, coupled with their loss of New Orleans, the the northern troops, the Union forces had complete control of the Mississippi River. Uh, the town of Vicksburg would not celebrate the 4th of July for 81 years, not till 1944 in the patriotic fervor of World War II would they begin to celebrate it again because they were defeated on July 4th. OK, OK, the next uh, uh, vic victory for the. Union Army in 1863 is Gettysburg, probably the most well-known battle of the entire war. Uh, this would be the other time that Robert E. Lee would invade the North in an attempt to bring the war again to the Northern civilians and again to put his army into position, if possible, to strike at Washington, D.C. 
So the summer of 63, Lee launched his second invasion into Northern Territory, pursued by first General uh, Joseph Hooker and then by General George Meade, two more incapable generals in a long line of them. Uh, Lincoln could still could not find a competent general to manage his Army of the Potomac. So Lee wants to bring the ravages of the war to the north, but also wants to score some politically meaningful victories, take the war out of the, out of the ravaged Virginia farmland. But another of his objective was to draw out the 90,000-man Union Army, destroy it, and march towards Washington and end the war. So how did this battle happen? I mean, they, neither one knew that they were there um, on some level. I mentioned before the Confederates were always under supply. So they're looking for shoes. They come they they come to the city of get they, they see the city of Gettysburg on a map. Let's go there and try to find some shoes. Uh, they did not know that the Union Army was in Gettysburg. So when they came there, they ran into each other literally, and this and this uh, battle begins. And you have some really hard fighting inside the city limits the first day. But the Confederates were able to push the Federals out of the city into the fields west and north of the town. But they were unable to secure the heights to the south. So that's where the Federals went. The Union Army went up to the high ground. When you have high ground, you, you have command of the battlefield because you're above everybody. You can, you can look down and, shoot and fire down on people. They have to come uphill to get to you. You can fortify yourself. So it's much advantage to have the high ground. So even though the Union Army was mostly, I wouldn't say defeated, but pushed out of Gettysburg, lost their advantage, they gained the high ground as a result. The following day, the second day of battle, um, uh, Robert E. Lee attacks the Federals on the heights, but fails to dislodge them. Some very famous fighting at Little Round Top and, and so on. Um, uh, both sides lose uh, lots of men, especially the South, on the 3rd of July. So remember, this battle is taking place at the same time that the Battle of Vicksburg is just, you know, hundreds of miles apart. On the 3rd, Lee attacked the Union Center on Cemetery Ridge, again, on the high ground, uh, but was defeated soundly. So this hasn't happened before. Lee's defeated soundly. So this attack on Cemetery Ridge is, is what is known as Pickett's Charge. So there's our, our slide looking for shoes, okay? Pickett's Charge. What is that? This is an infantry assault of approximately 15,000 Confederate soldiers coming against George Meade's troops, northern troops along Cemetery Ridge, about 6,500 Federals, okay? But they were in, in, in an entrenched defensive position. So you're talking about assaulting a fortified position behind defense works. You're going to come across three quarters of a mile of completely open land. It's like you're, you know, sitting ducks, your targets for artillery. And this is a, this is almost like a suicide mission. So General Longstreet, we remember him, um, James Longstreet was Lee's right hand man. He, he begs the general, don't do this. There's, there's no troops that can survive this and take that Union Center in a frontal assault. We're going to lose all of our men. But Lee did not listen to him, proving that his determination had clouded his military judgment for the first time. Okay, So nine, nine brigades of Confederate soldiers, thousands of men, march over this three-quarter mile of open ground and immediately are are destroyed by cannon fire the entire time. So all of the Confederates had more than twice the number of men in the, on the field. This is a rare occurrence in this war. They were, they were usually the ones that were outnumbered, but in this case, no. The Union troops had the high ground and could open fire on the exposed Confederates, you know, crossing an open field three quarters of a mile long. So it amounted to, to a suicide mission and one that, that had very little hope of succeeding, okay? So this ill-fated assault resulted in over 6,000 Confederate casualties versus only 1,500 Northern casualties. Uh, after the battle, Lee saw Pickett, so of course, General Pickett's the man that led this charge. Lee saw Pickett by himself kind of retreating from, from Cemetery Ridge, and he got angry. He said, General, uh, you know, uh, gather your division and prepare for a counterattack. And Pickett famously replies to Lee, 
general, I have no division. They're all gone. They've been all wiped out. This, uh, this battle would mark the end of the Battle of Gettysburg, as well as Lee's last invasion of the North. And finally, from the North's perspective, Lee had been beaten because he had made all the wrong calls for the first time. Uh, as the Southern Army retreats at Lee's order, he left over 20,000 soldiers and officers dead on the battlefield. Okay. Uh, Meade is then criticized by Lincoln later. You should have pursued him right there because he's got to cross that same river that that uh, that he did before. You, you can he has to wait there. You could you could finish him right there, but Meade does not follow him. Interesting side story this to this. Imagine being a person that lived in Gettysburg, a quiet town, but but a large town, a fair amount of people. And you're just living your life day in, day out, week in, week out. And then suddenly two armies show up inside your town and go to go to battle for three days. Uh, tens of thousands of, of, of corpses are around your city and the two armies leave. So you're left to deal with that. And you know, so this was a the aftermath of Gettysburg was a was a horrible one for the people that lived there. OK. So an interesting aspect of this battle that you can't deny, can't not look at, is the fact that, that Lee had a clear path to invade Washington, D.C. That's what he was looking for. That's what he said he was going for. Meade's men were in, were in a position to, when they were in a position to fight Lee, it brought them away from being in place to defend Washington. So Longstreet begged Lee to forget about Meade and the Union Army. Let's go after Washington, D.C., Maybe steal the war. Why worry about this battle when we, when we could win the war? Okay. Um, so so Longstreet begs him, but he doesn't do it. Um, uh, Lee displays a bizarre bullheadedness at this point of the war, <clears throat> and disagreed with Longstreet. And he said, "That is where the enemy is, and that is where I will fight them." So you know, this is perhaps his southern pride again, southern honor. Not being able, not being capable of turning away from a fight. There's the enemy. They are challenging me. I cannot back down and keep my honor intact. So you lose the battle because of your honor, but you'll, you 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 could have potentially won the war. But he makes that choice. It's a it's a you know it's a it's a drastic choice. Uh, so his second invasion of the North failed like the first one. And the, the casualties overall, the whole campaign was an estimated 51,000 soldiers killed, wounded, captured, or missing after Gettysburg. The battle is considered to be the high water mark of the Confederacy symbolically. Okay, what this means is that this is a, pl a plaque that's actually in the in the uh, park, and this is where where a a portion of the Union of uh, the Confederate Army actually did break the line at Cemetery Ridge. And of course, if that entire army could have got through that break, they could have moved on Washington pretty easily. But they were quickly stopped in, in right here. And this plaque is, is where the furthest point that they got to before they were stopped. So it's considered to be the high water mark of that day. This, this is the closest the Confederates got to winning that battle that day. But it's also somewhat seen as the High, is the best chance they had to win the entire war. From this point on, the, the Confederate efforts will diminish and and they, they will start to devolve and, and, and not be as, as potent a fighting force as they had been, okay? So these two Union victories in the same day that just so happened to be Independence Day spelled doom for the South. Of course, people in the North are saying God is looking down on us and saying that we're, the, we're his favorite people because this happened on Independence Day. Uh, the, the, the South was in trouble, but although they would survive two more years, they would never be the threat they had been. Uh, both sides at this point knew what the outcome of the war was going to be. Okay. Okay. November of 1863, uh, only four months after the battle of Gettysburg, Lincoln was invited to give a speech at the official dedication ceremony for the national cemetery of Gettysburg on the actual site of one of the bloodiest and most decisive battles of the Civil War. So as the as the citizens of Gettysburg gathered these bodies together, they decided to make a cemetery in their honor for the northern soldiers. The, the southern soldiers were all buried in, in a group grave, okay? But these were northern soldiers. 
So they're going to dedicate this, this cemetery, and they ask Lincoln to come and speak at the dedication. So he was not the featured speaker of the day. The person in front of him spoke for two hours, which, which was the case in those days. Speakers talked for a long time. Uh, Lincoln got up and in a matter of a few minutes was done and gave this address. And that's that's the address right there if you want to read it. I'm gonna, we're going to look at a film here in a minute that will that we'll read it to you also. Uh, but it only lasted a few minutes, 273 words. Uh, and he was embarrassed. Oh, my gosh. I, this guy spoke for two hours. I spoke for three minutes. Uh, they must think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not very uh, that wasn't very eloquent of me. But it's it's remembered today as one of the most important speeches in American history, because in it, he invokes the principles of human equality, containing the Declaration of Independence and connected the sacrifice of the Civil War with the, with the desire for a new birth of freedom. Uh, as well as the preservation of the union that was created in 1776 and its ideal of self-government. Okay, okay. let's watch our next film. This is entitled The Civil War, The Gettysburg Address. This is another excerpt from Burns' documentary about the Gettysburg Address, including a complete reading of it. Go ahead and watch that film and come on back. Okay, so on June 1st, 1865, a couple of months after... Lincoln's assassination, Senator Charles Sumner, that's the same guy that got beaten with the cane on the Senate floor, Sumner, referred to the Gettysburg Address, <clears throat> which had been given by <clears throat> President Abraham Lincoln. Sumner called the Gettysburg Address a monumental act and felt Lincoln was mistaken that the world would little note nor long remember what we say here. Rather, rather Sumner claimed, the world noted at once what was said and will never cease to remember it. The battle itself was less important than the speech. <clears throat> wow. But it's, it's true. This this is a cornerstone uh, document in American history without without question, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> so Lincoln reassesses the efforts here where, where the, the unions just had two major victories. Uh, let's uh, let's take a different approach here, okay? Let's let's name Grant the overall commander. <clears throat> and Lincoln says to, his, to Grant's detractors that say he's an alcoholic and he drinks too much, Lincoln says, tell me what brand of whiskey that Grant drinks. I would like to send a barrel of it to my other generals. Whatever he drinks is working for him. Maybe it'll work for the others, okay? <clears throat> so Grant takes command of the entire army, culminated by his impressive victory at, at Vicksburg. So after a long line of all these failed commanders, McDowell, McClellan twice, Hooker, Burnseed, Meade, as well as others, finally the North and Lincoln had a commander that knew how to maneuver an army in the field. Okay. Uh, there's a very famous book called Grant Moves South. What, what's that mean, Grant Moves South? Well, this is where he was different from the other commanders. When the other commanders would engage with Lee, <clears throat> once that battle was over, they would retreat back to the North and Lee would move South. Grant, win or lose, when he when he would would engage in battle with Lee, he pursued him south, kept kept after him, and Lee was like, "Who is this guy? Everybody else went back. Why is he following us?" So he he does this, and this this kind of overland campaign of 1864, where Grant continues to pursue Lee instead of retreating back north, he shadowed him relentlessly and put Lee on a constant defensive. And he'd, he'd never experienced that before. He pursued himself all the way to Petersburg, Virginia, where he surrounds Lee and lays siege to the city. So much like he'd done at Vicksburg, constantly shelling the town. Same kind of thing. But this one lasted for nine months, June 9th, 1864 to March 25th, 1865. This turned into trench warfare. By this time, the, the modern technology Weapons had far surpassed tactics, so if you came out of the ground, these weapons would wipe you out. So trench warfare, dig a trench and try to move slowly towards your enemy. So you'd kind of this mindless back and forth battle. You'd gain one day, lose the next. And neither side could gain an advantage, just kind of have this endless war. This is the precursor to World War One, that makes trench warfare very famous, okay? So Lee's kind of in this quagmire. This, although he's got control, he's 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 in control of the siege, but but it's not he's not gaining anything. 
While this is happening, General William Tecumseh Sherman is, is given orders by Grant to move on Atlanta, Georgia, and take that city out, defeat that city. So Atlanta fell to uh, Sherman in September 1864, and Sherman chased the Confederate troops through northern Georgia in an attempt to lure them out into a decisive, a decisive fight. But the Confederates' evasive tactics doomed Sherman's plan. They, they didn't want to face him. And they knew that they would, they would be wiped out. So Sherman developed an alternative strategy, different plan. He came up with this idea to destroy the South by laying waste to its economic and transportation infrastructure. This became known as the Scorched Earth Campaign or Tactics. Sherman's very famous for this, um, you know, reviled in the, in the South, not, not seen as a hero in any sense of the, of the word. Even today, many Southerners hate Sherman because he came into the South and destroyed it, burned it down, destroyed the rail uh, rail centers, burnt down plantations, destroyed crops, destroyed food, freed slaves, uh, destroyed their way of life. But he wasn't the only one. Philip Sheridan would do the same thing in the Shenandoah Valley uh, up in North Virginia, uh, this idea of just destroy everything. So, so this idea of scorched earth, again, you're trying to bring the ravages of war to the civilian population, destroy farms, burn plantations down, steal horses, kill livestock, steal valuables, foodstuffs, grains, whatever you can do, whatever you can do to ruin their lives, because you want to punish the farmers. You want to reduce their efforts for aiding the Confederate effort. These these people were farmers and they were growing crops that fed these troops. They were they were helping this Confederate cause by doing that. And this is a quote from, from uh, Sherman at that time. It is only those who have neither fought or shot nor heard the shrieks and groans of the wounded who cry aloud for blood. More vengeance, more desolation. War is hell. Let's bring it to the civilians, okay? And this is where he begins his very famous Sherman's March. It begins on November 15th when he cuts the last telegraph wire to Lincoln, to his superiors in the north. He left Atlanta in flames and pointed his army south. No word would be heard of him for the next five weeks. Of course, Lincoln is beside himself with worry. What's he doing? But this is Sherman's plan. Mr. President, let me go. I'm going to lay waste to Georgia. And very famously says, I'm going to make Georgia howl. Okay. So you look at the map here. You, you got 65,000 men. They cut this broad swath across the state. And they move towards Savannah there at the bottom. And they lay waste to everything in their paths. Okay. Uh, uh, and famously leaves his trademarks, Sherman neckties, Sherman sentinels. What does that mean? Well, on the left, you see that the these are these are rails from a railroad. They destroy the railroad, they tear it up, they take the rails, and they put them over a burning fire to soften them. And then when they get soft enough to to bend, they bend them around trees so the Confederates can't use them. Sentinels mean you burn down plantations. Any kind of business, and all you see is the chimneys standing. They look like sentinels. This was kind of his calling card, okay? Uh, so on the way, Sherman is joined by thousands of former slaves who are being liberated. So it wasn't the emancipation that liberated them. It was the fact that Sherman was here conquering, and that's what freed them. And they, they joined the army, and they bring up the rear of the march because they had no other place to go. Uh, so Sherman reaches Savannah on December 2nd. And he telegraphs the president with this message. I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah. But he's successful. And Lincoln is beside himself with, with glee. And, and he's very happy. So the loss of Atlanta and the destruction caused by Sherman <clears throat> uh, would be another nail in the coffin for the Confederacy. Okay. <clears throat> Sherman stayed in Savannah until the end of January and then continued his scorched earth campaign through the Carolinas. Okay. In the midst of all this, you have an election. So the American process doesn't end because you're at war. You still have elections and Lincoln's has to be reelected. Okay. And truly at this point, far from a popular president at that time, uh, the American public remembered all of his issues with his failed commanders. So his chance for re-election appeared dim. 
for much of 1864. Uh, he was weakened by widespread criticism of his handling of the war. They had these long string of defeats and disappointments, and many faulted Lincoln because of his strategy. Uh, also, conservative forces in the North were outraged by the Emancipation Proclamation, and they feared its impact on the future of society. All these freed slaves are going to enter into our cities and do what? So there's fear of this. So he's not not the most popular person. Uh, but, you know, uh, there's a war going on, so he he is renominated in 1864, okay? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the Democrats decide to adopt a platform that called for a ceasefire in a negotiated settlement with the South, and they nominate none other than George B. McClellan, the same guy that was timid and wouldn't, wouldn't move and got he was fired by Lincoln twice. And this is a quote from him. The president is no more than a well-meaning baboon. I went to the White House directly after tea where I found the original gorilla about as intelligent as ever. What a specimen to be at the head of our affairs now. OK, uh, so this is the man that they use. And, and this idea of a ceasefire, you're talking about not really having a victory. You, you just stop the war and perhaps the South can negotiate to keep slavery. So this wasn't very popular either. Uh, but the turning point came in September with Sherman's capture of Atlanta. And this, this victory lifted spirits throughout the North and revitalized the Lincoln campaign. And Lincoln and the Republicans warned, warned the voters, don't swap horse to the middle of the stream. We've come this far. Don't change horses now, even though it, it looks perilous. We'll be okay. Stay with me, okay? And and they do. So um, and Lincoln is Lincoln is reelected in 1865 to a second term, uh, and he actually wins the election by landslide. Uh, okay, so as 1865 began, it's just a matter of time for the Confederacy over to to be defeated. Over 100,000 men had deserted by this time. Common men, common, common Southern men, were angry about the abilities of the wealthy plantation owners to buy their way out of serving. If you had enough money, you could send somebody in your place. <clears throat> and many times they'd send slaves. So this is one example how a slave would be forced to fight for the Confederate Army. Um, <clears throat> an, Alabama, excuse me, an Alabama farmer said, all they want is to get you to fight for their infernal Negroes. Uh, back in Petersburg, Grant just got his siege going on, but it finally breaks, stalemate breaks through. Uh, the Confederates here forced to abandon both Petersburg and Richmond, and they're on the run, they're, and they're moving to the west in Virginia. Lincoln, uh, uh, the next day, comes to Richmond to tour it afterwards to, to see what's there. And, of course, all the all the slaves that were left behind adore him and are praising him at his feet, okay? So Grant chases Lee across Virginia, uh, captures him at a, or catches up to him at a place called Appomattox, defeats him, and Lee surrenders very famously at Appomattox Courthouse, April 9th, 1865. So this, this is the long war is over. Civil war is over. The Union had been preserved. The slaves have been permanently freed. So the so the South does not get what they want, and their way of life is over. The North is victorious, and they, they've, got, they've gotten all that they want. But then a shockwave is sent through the country, and an event happens that will change the course of history. And let's do a supplemental lecture right here. And, we'll, and this is entitled The Lincoln Assassination. Okay? <clears throat> okay, our outline. Uh, number one, background development. Letter A, Lincoln is assassinated as the war ends. Letter B, 16th president married with children. Number two, conspiracies. Letter A, kidnapping. Letter B, series of assassinations planned. And then subset number one, Grant. Number two, Seward. Number three, Johnson. Number four, Lincoln. <clears throat> okay, number three, nation grieves. Letter A, lies in state at the Capitol Rotunda. Letter B, funeral train uh, with his son, Willie. So his son, Willie, had died during the war also. They, they take both bodies back. <clears throat> Number four, Booth escapes. Letter A, <clears throat> David Harold. 
letter B, Samuel Mudd, letter C, shot and killed in a barn in Virginia. <clears throat> Number five, trial. Letter A, four co-conspirators were convicted. Letter B, all were hung. Number one, Mary Surratt, the first executed woman in American history. Number six, relevance. Lincoln's assassination changed the course of American history, resulting in a tumultuous and ineffective Reconstruction era. <clears throat> okay? Let's get started. Okay, so April 14th, 1865, Lincoln is assassinated by a very famous actor and Confederate sympathizer, John Wilkes Booth. This occurs at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., while Lincoln is enjoying a play. Okay? This happens only five days after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee had surrendered to Grant at Appomattox, Virginia. <clears throat> John Wilkes Booth is the assassin, uh, a Maryland native born in 1838 into a family of noted actors. His brother Edwin was very famous, as well as John. <clears throat> so these were well-known men that, that were recognized everywhere they went. They were famous. Despite his Confederate sympathies, Booth remained in the North during the Civil War to pursue his, his acting career. But as the, as the war entered its final stages and it was going to be the feet of the, of the South, he plotted with others to originally kidnap Abraham Lincoln. That was the first plan. In those days, it was different than now. The presidents would mix with the public. And after a long day fighting this war, many nights Lincoln would take a carriage ride in, around the outskirts of, of the city of Washington, D.C., and Booth and his co-conspirators knew that he was going to come one night. They, they were going to lay in wait for him. But, but Lincoln didn't come, so it kind of foiled their planned abduction. This was only three weeks before the assassination. Two weeks later, Richmond fell to Union forces. Confederate armies were in near collapse across the South, so the idea of kidnapping fell apart. <clears throat> And Booth came up with a desperate plan to save the Confederacy. Okay, he's, he's going to assassinate the, the president, <clears throat> as well as others, as we'll see. So he learned that Lincoln was going to be in, in the city to attend uh, the play Our America's Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. So Booth determined that he would go there and kill the president. Okay, But he had other co-conspirators, as well as other assassination attempts planned. It was going to be a simultaneous assassination, okay? Not just Lincoln, but also Vice President Johnson, Secretary of State Seward. So the president and two of his possible successors, all to try to throw the United States government into disarray, okay? Uh, Booth also wanted to kill Ulysses Grant, but Grant was out of town. So Grant, Grant escaped an assassination attempt, okay? <clears throat> So this plan is 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 hatched, and uh, Seward's uh, son answers the door. It's pistol whipped by a man. His bodyguard was stabbed but not killed. His daughter pushed aside. Uh, Seward was actually sick in bed, but the man came in and stabbed him while he was in bed, cut his cheek and neck, but also did not kill him. <clears throat> and then the attacker fled. Johnson's attacker actually lost his courage and got drunk instead. Even though Johnson was alone in his room and would have been easily subdued and probably killed, uh, uh, Booth goes after Lincoln himself at Ford's Theater. So here's an actual picture of Ford's Theater today. This is a, a museum. This is the private box that that Lincoln was sitting in with his wife and, and friends. And here's the stage down here where the play was was being held. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So Booth goes to Ford's Theater, and you know, walking around backstage or anywhere in that theater wouldn't have bothered anybody. He was a well-known actor and, and would have the right of way. So nobody questioned him being there. So he slips the, into Lincoln's box at 10.15 and has a 44 caliber single-shot Derringer pistol, and he fires it in the back of Lincoln's head. He then leaps from the box. So a typical actor wants the limelight, right? Instead of going back out the door and escaping, and nobody would have questioned him, he jumps from the state from the box to the stage, and he screams, "Sic semper tyrannis, or thus ever to tyrants." This is the Virginia State motto. This, of course, he's calling Lincoln a tyrant. Okay, uh, the crowd 
interpret this unfolding drama as part of the play. I mean, he's an actor. We 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 know. Oh, there there's John Wilkes Booth. He he must be part of this play. But they realize because the first leg's screaming that something's wrong. Booth quickly runs out the back stage and out the back door and escapes. Uh, his friend David Harold had a horse waiting for him. Unfortunately for Booth, when he jumped from the from the box to the stage, he broke his leg. So he's got a broken leg to deal with, okay? Uh, so a doctor is summoned, comes to the president, slumped in his chair. Uh, Lincoln's paralyzed, struggling to breathe. <clears throat> uh, so they decided to take him to a more comfortable place. They took him across the street to a boarding house, placed him on a bed, and the Surgeon General arrived at the house, and it was concluded that Lincoln could not be saved and would probably die during the night. Uh, Vice President Andrew Johnson, unaware that he had been targeted to be killed that night also, and members of Lincoln's cabinet and several of his closest friends stood vigil by the president's bedside in the boarding house. Uh, the first lady lay in the bed in the adjoining room with her eldest son, Robert, at her side, overwhelmed with shock and grief. Lincoln was pronounced dead at 7.22 a.m., April 15th, 1865, at the age of 56. Okay, uh, The president is dead. This is a shocking event. And that's an actual picture of him in his coffin. Placed in a temporary coffin, draped with a flag, escorted by armed cavalry to the White House, where surgeons conducted a thorough autopsy, a doctor cut a lock of his hair for the first lady. Uh, Dr. Edward Curtis was one of the surgeons who removed the bullet from Lincoln's head. He said the team could not stop staring at the bullet. The cause of such mighty changes in the world's history as we may perhaps never realize. And that was prophetic because the, the Direction that this country took after the Civil War changed without Lincoln to be there to guide it. Okay, News travels quickly. Flags across the country flew at half mass. Businesses were closed. You know, People who had recently been rejoicing at the end of the Civil War now reeled from Lincoln's shocking assassination. His body was taken to the Capitol Rotunda to lay in state for public viewing. Uh, three days later, his remains were boarded onto a train to take him to Springfield, Illinois, where he had lived before becoming president. And tens of thousands of Americans lined the tra railroad route to view the trains that went by to pay their last respects. The train would slow down when it got into the cities. Uh, Lincoln and his son, Willie. Willie had died in the White House of typhoid fever in 1862. Uh, his body had been... Uh, you know, disinterred and, and, and taken to, to be with his father. Uh, both were interred in, on May 4th, 1865 at Oak Ridge Cemetery near Springfield, Illinois. This is an actual death mask that was taken of Lincoln uh, the day that uh, he died. Okay. So what happened to Booth? And he escapes and is on the run. Uh, Union soldiers hot in his trail. Uh, but uh, he managed to escape the capital city with an accomplice, David Harold, the man that held, held the horse for him, one of his co-conspirators, and they, and they make their way into Maryland. Uh, but Booth's got a broken leg, so he's got to deal with that. So they look, look for a doctor, and they find a man named Samuel Mudd, a doctor who treated Booth's broken leg. Uh, uh, Mudd had no idea who Booth was, what he'd done. He's a Southerner, but he had no idea that he just killed the president. Uh, Mudd's action would later earn him a life sentence because he, he was seen as a co-conspirator, although that, would, that sentence was later commuted. But he spent a number of years in a prison on an island off the, off the Florida Keys where you, there's no escaping from, a pretty brutal, brutal place to be. So pretty, pretty tough to be him. You're just trying to help somebody, you're doing your job, and then you get arrested for being a conspirator conspirator for the president's assassination. This is where the saying, his name is Mud, comes from, okay? His name is actually spelled with two Ds at the end, M-U-D-D. Okay, um, so Booth is in better health. His leg is set. He, they make their way across the Potomac to Virginia, but then they're surrounded in the Virginia farmhouse by Union troops. Booth and Harold were hiding out in the barn. The troops set fire to it, hoping to flush the fugitives out. Uh, Harold surrendered and came out. Booth remained inside. 
A sergeant of the army shot Booth in the neck through a crack in the wall as the barn was burning. Uh, he claimed that, that Booth had raised his gun as if to shoot. So Booth was rescued alive from the burning barn, uh, but did not not last long. It lingered for three hours before gazing in his hands and uttering his last words, useless, useless. Okay. Uh, so this is the end of that. I mean, we, the the, uh, the assassin's been caught and he's dead. But there's these conspirators, and this this become this whole conspiracy is is found out about. So four of Booth's conspirators, co-conspirators, were convicted for their part in the assassination and publicly executed by hanging on July 7th, 1865. And that's an actual picture of the four of them hanging there uh, 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 to their deaths. Okay. If you look at the far left, you see that this that that's a woman in a in a in a dress, and this is Mary Surratt. So David Harold also, but Mary Surratt on the left. Uh, what was what did she do? Uh, apparently, her only crime was renting Booth a room at her boarding house. Booth rented a room from her, and this would serve as the meeting place for the would-be kidnappers. Now, there's been some discussion that perhaps she was in on it too, but no real evidence ever found. So Surratt's family is still trying to clear her name even today, okay? Uh, relevance. Lincoln's assassination changed the course of American history, resulting in a tumultuous and ineffective Reconstruction era, okay? Okay, that is the end of supplemental lecture number 16, and that is our last supplemental lecture for this class, okay? Okay, so what's the result of this war? War is over. Lincoln's gone. The South lay in ruins. Their economy was ruined with little hope of gaining anything back. This would result in the Reconstruction Era, which was, is the subject of our last chapter. Uh, the South needs to be reconstructed. And chapter 15, we'll, we'll learn about the absolute failures of this era. Okay, Okay, that is the end of chapter 14. Thank you.